Amen. Well, let's turn to his word. Let me open us in prayer, and, uh, and we'll just sort of uh, immerse ourselves in his wonderful word to us. So let's pray. Father, we do indeed thank you for your great loving kindness you show in so many ways. And as we come to your word, um, that one comes to mind. Your word is alive and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, and through it, you, you equip us uh, to walk. So, um, Lord, as we come today at this precious part of your scripture about the, the crucifixion of your son, we pray that you would, through your spirit, <clears throat> give us unusual insight into what you're trying to tell us in all of this. And that uh, the eyes of our mind and the eyes of our heart would be opened and enlightened as a result. So we come uh, this morning um, eager, excited uh, to hear what you have to say to our hearts and through all this to change us, to change us. And we find more and more our hearts are drawn to you in love and our, um, our desires are pulled away more and more away from this place and more to you. So we pray you do that this morning as well through your word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in John 19. You know, in the normal, in the normal calendar, I don't know what's normal, but in many calendars for Christian churches, this would be Palm Sunday. And so it's the Sunday before uh, Easter. We've been, we started Palm Sunday uh, back in January when it was frigid cold, single-digit temperatures, and there was lots of snow on the ground. So we have spent the last three months or so um, in the, the last five or six days of the life of Jesus. So, uh, so that's where we are today. We're at the crucifixion of Jesus, and, um, and we're following along. It's in John 19, if you want to follow with us, or I'll have the verses up here if you want to follow. And we left last week with this scene right here, with Pilate addressing the crowds and talking about Jesus. And, uh, and finally, in chapter 19, verse 16 of John, so he then handed him over to them to be crucified. And that's where we start today, is, uh, is the process that leads up to the crucifixion of Jesus. But what I want to do is I want to do another little archaeology, archaeology minute. Can I do that before we jump into this very heavy topic? We did this last week. I got, I got some good responses, so I thought I, want, I would give you another one right now because this is kind of cool. If you ever go to Jerusalem, if you ever go to Israel, uh, you'll, without a doubt, you'll go to this place with these two gray roofs right here. It's the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It's right smack dab in the middle, sort of, of Jerusalem. Very densely populated part of Jerusalem. And the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, many people believe, is the exact place where Jesus died on Calvary and also was put in the tomb, right there. But when you go there, uh, you'll, in fact, if you go down to see that center of those arches, the entry looks sort of like this, and that's about all you see of this place. And you think, this is where Jesus was crucified and buried? I mean, it's a building. <laughs> Well, and you got to understand that over the years, many of the places in Jerusalem that had important things took place in, uh, people built stuff on top of it. And I want to show you something interesting about this so that you won't be completely discouraged when you go to Israel and say, this doesn't look right. Because wasn't Jesus crucified like on a hill outside of town and then buried in a tomb cut into some stone? Yeah, but uh, oh, by the way, before I do that, see that right there? Can you see that right there? There's a funny little piece of trivia about this place. I'll, I'll blow that up for you. That's the blow up. What do you see? A ladder. That ladder has been there since the mid-1700s. <laughs> and it's been the contentions of the six ruling Christian groups that run jointly, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They can't agree on who gets to move the ladder. Yeah, no kidding. Who, who gets to move it? I don't know. I mean, someone, someone set that up in about 1750, they think, to work on some of the masonry, and it hasn't been touched since because no one feels like they have the authority to do it because the other one of the five groups that organize places will get mad at them. So that ladder has been there. Uh, the earliest recordings we have is since about 1750. And uh, so there it sits to this very day, this silly little ladder, which kind of illustrates one trivial thing as we go along, is the fact that even in Christendom, there's some pretty silly things going down. Uh, and in, in running the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's many different Orthodox churches that take turns and cohabit the place. It, it's, kind of a, it's kind of goofy in many respects. So if you go there, don't let that put you off either. The fact that there's six Christian Orthodox groups that vie with each other. We were there a couple years ago. And it turned out someone hit some bell and a choir for one church group started doing its thing. And at the same time, a few minutes later, one for the other one's over here and they're doing this thing. And the whole place is just crazy sounding. You go, what is going on? 
It sort of detracts from the whole thing about going and seeing where Jesus was crucified. But this is the archaeology I want to show you. Um, that's just a piece of trivia. Uh, when you go, uh, these, uh, let me go back to this. See the two gray domes? Those two gray domes roughly correlate to the place on the left, the tomb of Jesus on the right, uh, where Calvary was over that. That's what they're meant to depict. And when you do a cutaway of this, there's the two domes right there. Uh, over here on the, uh, the left, um, let's see if my pointer will work. Oh, my pointer's not working this morning. Um, but over here on the left, right there in that thing, you see it's this, it's this big, if you go inside, it's this big square monolith thing in the middle. It looks like something from the movie 2001, kind of. But this big monolith, what that is, is that's actually the tomb of Jesus. What? Well, I know you're saying that doesn't look right to me. And, uh, and then over here on the right, this place over here is, is Calvary. What? Well, here's what happened over the years. If you do a cutaway, it turns out this orange and yellow stuff is, is the original ground and dirt around this place. On the right, there's actually a small hill that has a piece of bedrock coming up, pointing out, which is, which is the top of this small hill, um, which is Calvary. And on the left is uh, an old worn out kind of quarry where they used to quarry granite uh, um, stuff. It was unused by the time of Jesus, but they had uh, cut in some brand new tombs into the face of it where the rock face was there. And so there were some tombs cut out. Over the years, around fourth century, they decided to build a church over this. So they cleared away all that orange dirt. And in the tomb area, they left a piece of the rock right around it. And that square thing right there is the square thing you saw in the picture. It's a, it's a piece of the stone bedrock in the side of a hill that now has been had a church built around it. Crazy. And just a few steps away, just a few steps over here, this piece of bedrock is still inside the church. You can look in through some walls, some glass, and you can see this rock right here. And they built this place where Jesus was. And then they, and then, then they put all this religious goo on top of it. Don't let that put you off. This is probably very, very likely the place it happened. And uh, we can talk a whole bunch more about that later. But when you look at it, you realize the distance between where Jesus was crucified and where the tomb was is, a, is about as far from the front of our building and the back of our building. They're like right next to each other. And things have been built on them since then, but it's, uh, but it's really there. And you can see actually see the rock of the cutaway a quarry hillside that's right there. So very interesting. So when you, go to, when you go to Israel, next time you go to Israel, you go to Jerusalem, they take you in the Holy Sepulchre, you're put off by all the religiousness of building over it. Yeah, look around a little bit, you'll realize that this is, it's all just stuff added on top of what's just a very simple arrangement. Um, it's uh, to this day, the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre the church is actually inside the city limits. By the time of Jesus, it was just outside the city limits. So that's our archaeology moment for today. Okay, let's get back to Jesus. So they handed him over to them to be crucified. And uh, we pick up the story in verse 17. So they took Jesus, therefore, he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. So he carries his own cross. This is the, this is the typical routine of the day. It wasn't special for Jesus. By the way, uh, the reason that he carried, why the Romans had them carry their cross, I almost asked you a question you were going to answer, and I violated my own rule here. Do you know why? Don't answer that. The reason they carried it through town is because it was a way to discourage future lawbreakers from doing what this guy got in trouble for. It was a way to advertise, don't do what he did, or else this will be your fate as well. So it was part of the uh, way that the Romans would subjugate the people there and say, you need to behave or else. And this was the or else that happened. By the way, uh, just to clear something up, Golgotha, Golgotha is the word in Aramaic or Hebrew uh, that means the place of the skull. That's, John does that translation for us. In, uh, I think it's in, in uh, Greek, the word is, is, uh, is cronium. Actually, you know, you know cranium? It's actually it's cranium is what it is. It's like cranium. And then if you take that word and you translate it into Latin, the Latin version of that word skull is calvarium which is where we get the word Calvary. So Calvary is not a name of a town or a small place. It's just the Latin version for the skull word. Oh, okay, that's what that is. So they take him out there. <clears throat> Verse 18, there they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. So we have the, the well-known scene where Jesus is crucified with the two, the two thieves next to him on either side. Verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription. And he put it on the cross, 
It was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now, when you put a sign on top of the cross, this is part B of the advertising from Rome, don't do this. Because what they would put on the cross is they would say, this is what he did wrong. So he walked through town like an an evil sort of parade, say, don't do this. What did he do? You'll see, you'll see. He gets crucified. His crime is put on top of the cross. And it says, this is why he's been crucified. And so Pilate puts the crime and the crime is king of the Jews. What kind of crime is that? King of the Jews. It's a notice is what it is. Serves notice. Don't make yourself king or else. This is, and this caused quite a rile among the people right there. Uh, the leaders, therefore many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek. And why does he mention it's near the city? Don't answer that. Why do you mention near the city? Because... There were principal gates that went in and out of the walled city of Jerusalem. Even to this very day, you can only get into the old city of Jerusalem a handful of ways, these gates. And these gates were a way that not only kept the defenders out, but also if you were going to sell stuff or if you wanted to, if if it was the ancient equivalent of billboards, you don't put billboards up in the middle of nowhere. You put them where most of the traffic is. So they waited until they were close to the city here and, uh, and he was crucified near the city and then put this sign right where it'd be seen by the most number of people as they walked in and out of that part of the city. It was an advertisement thing to keep the people in line from Rome. In fact, you know, it's in three languages. If you go to Israel today, you'll find all the signs in three languages to this very day. It's usually, in, it's, in, it's in Hebrew, it's also in Arabic, it's also in, in English. You can pretty much know where you're going because they translate that for you. <clears throat> Dead Sea. By the way, isn't it surprising that the stories in the Bible are actually on signs in Israel. You can go to Jericho. You can go to Jerusalem. You can go to, well, Ma'al Adumim, that's not in the Bible, but you can go all these different places. For for many people, when you go to Israel, it's it's an odd shock when you get there and you realize that all these towns are on signs. And something deep in your mind goes, this place really exists. It's not just in the Bible. It's, it's not just in the Bible, and you always knew that, but until you see it on street signs, it doesn't sink in that what you're reading, what we're reading today, really happened in real places, places you can actually drive to today and go there. And there's no doubt about them. There's no doubt so much that they even endorse the location by putting them on signs. They're real places. Um, by the way, I mentioned... Uh, he's crucified near the city, and the sign was put in three languages because the principal travelers would usually understand at least two of these three languages. So that was the way to make sure that everybody could read the sign, right? And put it by a principal uh, travel place. The idea is more like this. You put a sign where people are going to see it. And during the crucifixion, he was crucified in a place that the major traffic through the area would see this sign. It would serve notice to everyone. And by the way, at this time during Passover, There are a lot of people in town from all over the world. It was one of the three principal feasts that every Jew had to come back to Jerusalem for. There were more than just three feasts, but there were only three that you said, go back to Jerusalem for. All over the world, Jews from all over the world would be filing in through the gates into the city where the crucified people were, where the sign said, King of the Jews. Can you imagine? You're going back to Jerusalem as a Jew, to celebrate Passover. The Passover is a celebration of God getting the people out of their bondage in Egypt. And part of the reason, part of the way that happened was through those plagues. And the last one was the death of the firstborn. And the way that you could protect yourself from the wrath of God and the death of the firstborn was to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood of that lamb and mark the doorposts of your house, which by the way, sort of forms a cross, interestingly enough, left, right, up, drips down the bottom. And, and then that plague would pass over your house. They come to Jerusalem to celebrate this event, this singular event in the life of the nation of Israel and how God has saved them. And one of the first things they see when they come in proximity to the city gates is this man on a cross with his crime, king of the Jews. Now, when you see that, you have a choice to make. Is he the king of the Jews? Or isn't he the king of the Jews? If he is the king of the Jews, why is he on a cross? If he's the king of the Jews, how comes all all of his 
soldiers as the king aren't fighting for him. I mean, king of the Jews, is this... I can, I can imagine people coming into the city from after traveling by foot for maybe a week and looking and saying, is this a joke? I mean, what is it about this man? And as they come into town, one of the first topics of conversation would be, who is this guy I saw just outside when I got into town? Who is it? And it says king of the Jews. But, so you can understand that during this Passover time, God has used this dense migration of all of these literally up to a million people coming into town to serve notice to everyone saying, who is this man? It was on the lips of everybody during the week. And this is how he did it. This is how he did it. So the chief priests and the Jews were saying to Pilate, hey, hey, this is my gym, that's the gym translation. Hey, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I'm the king of the Jews. Don't you say he's a king say that he said he's the king. That's his crime because he's wacko. That's what the religious priests were saying. He's wacko. I mean, that's why we said you to be killed because of blasphemy. He claimed to be equal with God. That's blasphemy. And clearly he's on the cross. He's not God because God's powerful enough to keep himself from getting crucified. So say that he said, I'm the king of the Jews. And what's Pilate's snappy comeback? He said, what I've written, I have written. And why did Pilate do that? Why did, why did Pilate say, oh, you're right, Psh, technical error, he said. No, it was delivered on Pilate's part. And there's a lot of debate about why he would do just this thing. But it's, in its simplest explanation, it's an in-your-face to the religious leaders that are there. Yeah, I think Pilate is kind of perturbed about the fact that he's had his day disturbed and they brought this guy to him who clearly hasn't done anything to threaten the Roman Empire Hasn't done anything. Pilate goes to them at our count from the four different Gospels seven times and says, I see no guilt. 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 I see no guilt guilt in this man. Seven times. And he's perturbed about the fact that these guys have this agenda. So this is kind of an in-your-face king of the Jews. Ha. It also has some double meanings built into it. King of the Jews. Look what kind of king you have who is so easily overcome and overpowered by the ranks of Rome, king of the Jews. I mean, there's so much irony in all of this. But, you know, Pilate's motivation, although it's secular and it's probably sinful and all that kind of in-your-face sort of stuff, God uses that to challenge every person coming into Jerusalem that week. Is he the king of the Jews? I I mean, I I can't imagine a more straightforward, direct way for God to challenge his people about who this man is than what he did right here. And Pilate wrote it down to challenge him. Pilate could have written on there insurrectionist because he was starting to gain quite a big following of people. And that big following of people threatens people in power, especially the people in religious power. Insurrectionist, um, crazy man. Uh, he, he could have written a whole number of things to discourage certain behaviors in his domain. But he writes, King of the Jews. And that point on, for the rest of those days, that's what's on everybody's lips. King of the Jews? Psh, but he's on a cross. Okay? 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. By the way, this is the only gospel where we know how many soldiers were there, the four soldiers. So they split his garments. That was, that was um, routine, is that the guys who had the uh, crucifixion duty got to take whatever the guy was still wearing. Um, and the tunic. A tunic, boy, what a bad English translation. The word that's there doesn't really directly correlate to anything you're wearing right now. It's, it, but it's, a, it's the garment that's closest to the skin is what it is. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's not underwear, though. It's, it's, it's hard to translate. But, it, but in Jesus' case, this is a, a large piece of fabric which is seamless, I mean, it's, which is very unusual and very valuable. So they realize that and say, okay, wait a second, we've got a better idea. The tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, so they said to one another, well, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. Um, in some of the modern translations, they like to put in there, they threw dice for it. 
uh, which is just a colloquial way of saying they gambled for it. Okay, so they said this thing's too valuable to sp- separate. It's like it's like having a stolen diamond that's like as big as your fist. As soon as you cut it up in little pieces, its value goes down. This thing's very valuable in one piece. So let's see who gets it. And then John gives us a little parenthetical thought. This was to fulfill the scripture, and the scripture said. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, and therefore the soldiers did these things. Um, So John's telling us this comes from the Old Testament. It comes from Psalm 22. It comes from Psalm 22. And he's trying to get us to understand that what's happening here isn't just a tragic accident. It's not just a tragic accident. This is actually going exactly according to plan, yeah, I mean, with even the selfish, sinful motivations of the men involved, this is going exactly according to plan. And it was already written about a thousand years earlier in Psalm 22. There's no accidents here. You know, when, when you talk to people who don't believe in Jesus, they'll say, isn't it unfortunate that a man like Jesus, who was such a great teacher, I love his teachings myself. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. It's just too bad that he, you know, he rubbed the leaders the wrong way and got himself killed. Dog. Gone, bad luck. And that's, I mean, that's a secular view. The biblical view is, nope, this moment has been coming and has been predicted in the Old Testament for over a thousand years. And John's trying to say, wake up, wake up. This man we follow didn't just accidentally die. This was purposeful on his part and on God's part for a particular reason. Well, why would the king of the Jews be killed? That's the question that everyone's asking in town during the time. That's what everyone who understands from the Old Testament, that's where everyone who's listening to John's gospel being read years later says in Psalm 22, but why would this man be killed if it's that purposeful? It's not an accident. Remember in the garden? Remember in the garden? When, they, when he gets arrested and they come up to him and Peter shwing pulls out his sword, oh, right like that. And uh, I always envision it glowing like the one in Lord of the Rings, but it wasn't glowing. He just pulls this thing out and, and he lops off the ear of the high priest servant, right? Ear comes off. And Jesus, I, I have always envisioned, in the process of sticking the ear back on the side of this guy's head, um, he says, Peter, Peter, I, I don't need your sword. I could summon... 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. I think he's using the word legion in the loose sense, which means whoa, almost uncountable. But in the Roman sense, that's 6,000. 6,000 is a legion. 12 times 6,000 is 72,000. He's trying to say, Peter, come on. If, if I want to get out of this by force, no sweat. I've got this. This is a deliberate act of the king. Why die? Why not just establish a kingdom? Here's a good idea. There's enough bad guys in town, the guys who just put you through that kangaroo court all night long. Take them out. Take them out. Walk into the the temple area. Proclaim yourself the Messiah. You know, when the Roman people like Pilate and all of his guards get a little uppity about the fact, oh my gosh, we have an insurrection going, then you do that thing and you wipe out Rome. Be a kingdom. Be a kingdom. Die. And in fact, when you read the Old Testament, when you read the passages that talk about the coming Messiah, they're, they're pretty clearly marked. You find that there's two, there's two streams of predictions about this Messiah. Very clearly, two streams. There's one of this suffering Messiah everywhere. And there's one of this kingly Messiah. None of the rabbis ever said these were two different Messiahs. But they could never quite figure out why it was you had this consistent stream of the suffering Messiah and this consistent stream of the kingly Messiah. How can those both be true? And so, because it was a quandary, they took that problem and put it up on the shelf. That's a very popular phrase used in Mormonism. I just put that problem up on the shelf. We'll deal with that later. They put that up on the shelf, and as a result, they decided to prefer one over the other because it was easier to handle, and the one they preferred was the kingly Messiah. So when Jesus came fulfilling that first stream of the suffering Messiah, they had completely forgotten about that. He did not match the kingly Messiah. He's supposed to have a kingdom that will never end. And he's on a cross. Wrong guy. They missed it. Let's move on. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. By the way, if you're visiting with us today, these pictures I'm using are from a famous artist from the late 19th century named 
James Jacques Tissot, and he visited the Holy Land and uh, basically took what he saw there and painted scenes with the actual scenes that he would see. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a view from Jesus' perspective, looking down. And you see what's off in the background in the back there? The tomb. That's actually from that picture of the archaeology I showed you. That's a pretty accurate distance when you go there and you check it out. It's about that close. Who was there? His mother, Mary. His mother's sister, unnamed. Mary, the wife of Clopas. And Mary Magdalene. Now, if you're starting to count Marys and you're saying, I'm getting confused. That's because during those times, and this is a fact as well, there weren't many names in common use. I mean, you could almost count them on your hands and feet. Well, a few more. Maybe a couple people's hands and feet. And Mary was a very, very, very popular name, as evidenced right here. In this passage right here, what draws most um, commentators' interest is the unnamed woman. And you know why? It's because through John's gospel, anytime someone shows up who he, he decides not to name, it's usually himself or a family member. That's just the way John wrote, he, in deference, you know. Remember all the times he talks about the apostle Jesus loved? That's John. He would never name himself. It's kind of a humble thing. So many people are attracted to this unnamed woman and saying, well, who could that be that's related to John that he wouldn't mention because of the family issues? So a lot of speculation, and it's just speculation, is that it's John's mom. Ooh, but it's just speculation. If that's true, it makes what's going to happen next very fascinating. But we just don't know. She's one of those mystery people who probably, 60-70% sure, is a relative of John's, and that's why he's not mentioning her name. So anyway, Jesus sees them there. And when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, eh, eh, didn't say John, disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Jesus was the oldest in his family, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. That makes sense. So he was the oldest in his family. Um, very much so as the dying oldest son, it was his responsibility. If dad was no longer alive, when we haven't seen Joseph on the scene for a long time in the gospel, so the presumption is he's, he's gone, then it's Jesus' responsibility as the good son and head of the household to take care of the household. And there's his mom. So he says to John, take care of her, would you? And John says, okay. And so at that point, Mary comes into his household. That's why it's fascinating if this other unnamed woman is John. Then it turns out, I just left out, is his real mom. Then interesting thing that he says, here's another mother for you as well. Take care of her. Interesting. Takes her in the household. 28. So after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, said, oops, I passed right by it, I'm sorry. There it is. I'm thirsty. He says, I'm thirsty. Knowing that all things have already been accomplished. What's he working on in his head as he's on the cross? Well, all things have been accomplished. You know, like we just quoted Psalm 22, and there's so many other things, especially in the Psalms. Uh, that mention in Isaiah, a mention about the, the death of the suffering Messiah and all that kind of stuff. Jesus, in a way, is going through the list in his head and saying, wow, we're almost done. Almost done. There's one thing left. Now, by the way, critics, again, of Christianity will say Jesus was a poser. They'll say he was a very smart man. He knew the scriptures really well. He orchestrated all these predictions about what the Messiah would be, stepped into the place, and basically fooled everybody because he knew the predictions so he could fulfill them. That's actually, a, that's not a bad argument, except you can't orchestrate where you're born. And that was mentioned, Bethlehem. You can't orchestrate how you're going to die. Not really. And in a second, you'll see that the circumstances of Jesus' death are things that he really could not control. I mean, we just talked about this last week. The religious authorities were out to kill Jesus because he'd claimed to be blasphemous. Well, in the Old Testament, if someone is guilty of blasphemy, the, the, the judgment is death. But in the Jewish community, death is affected by stoning. Well, that wouldn't fit the predictions of what the Psalms talked about in terms of death, and there's more to come. How could he, how could he orchestrate the fact 
that he would have to die in such a way that the Roman authorities would have to do it their way and the religious authorities would not do it their way. How do you orchestrate that kind of thing? I mean, it's not like he stood in front of Pilate and Pilate says, which way do you want to go, Jesus? You want to go stoning? You want to go crucifixion? What do you think? Can't do that. It was just the way it was. You can't orchestrate that stuff. And there's a lot of things that you just cannot orchestrate. But at this point, Jesus is saying, there's one thing still to go. So he says, I'm thirsty. And a jar of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. And therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it's finished. Hyssop is a generic word used for a lot of, something like a dozen different plants in Israel. But one of them happens to be a long reed. A lot of people think that the the way that they got this drink up to him was on the end of this reed, this hyssop reed. The sour wine, where did that come from? That was a, that was a very poor man's drink. That was a drink that was used for, um, for servants, for slaves, and for soldiers. It was probably the secret stash of the soldiers right there. Um, may, I don't know if you know, but drinking, drinking natural water during the, their time was dangerous because of sanitary reasons. So the only safe stuff to drink was the stuff that had a little bit of fermented wine in it. And um, uh, you could be totally safe if you just drank fermented wine. (laughs) But that was also very expensive. So for the servant classes and stuff like that, the way that they would make the water safe to drink would be to stir a little bit of wine into it. And many times that little bit of wine that would disinfect that water would start to turn, you know, and get kind of icky, right? And turn into vinegary kind of stuff. Not really pleasant to drink, but at least it's safe. It's, it's not going to induce diarrhea. <laughs> so anyway, that's what they've got right there. So they take this, this poor man's drink, basically, and they, they bring it up to him, and he says, it's finished. When it says he's finished, what is it he's finished? What's he, what's he completed? Well, everything. In this particular case, just looking at it in the context, he, all of the prophecies have been finished at this point. But not all the prophecies. <laughs> but at this point in this stage of the process, the ones that needed to be done, all done. So at that point, Jesus says, we're at the end. It's finished. It's finished. It's completed. And in fact, when you see the word in the New Testament, finished or completed or perfect, it means the end of a process to bring to completion. That's what that means. Even perfect in the sense when it says be perfect, is giving you more of the idea that you're the end of a long process of change. And now, ah, perfecto. That's what it really means. And that's what it says right here. Jesus is saying, I'm at the end of a process. And we got done. It's done. Again, it, it shows the fact that this entire account isn't just a very tragic accident. Because in, even with Jesus saying that, he's saying purposefully, this is the task put ahead of me, As he says to Pilate, this is the reason why I was born, and now it's done. Purposeful. The purposeful plan of God from the beginning of creation, from the moment that Adam and Eve fell, was to fix it through this. Thousands of years we've waited. It's finished. But it's not done. It goes on. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. How can the Son of God die? How can the Son of God die? Isn't he the Messiah whose kingdom will never end? If his kingdom will never end, then the king can never die. That's obvious logic. How can he die? Unless, ah, unless the kingdom has less to do with this physical place in our physical lives and something bigger and better beyond that. And that opens up a whole new idea then. And that's why Jesus, in his good confession before Pilate, says, yes, I am a king, but not of this world. The kingdom is bigger than just this existence. Can the king who's eternal die? Yes, because the kingdom is much bigger than just this physical existence. Much, much bigger. And that's, that's the key to this understanding. Well, the Jews, because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, it was a big deal, they asked Pilate 
that the legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Again, this is actually a pretty routine request. Uh, the, the law of Moses said that um, you know, the body of someone who's died can't, can't be remain overnight in that sense. They have to be buried quickly. So they're asking that the legs be broken. Now, why would breaking the legs speed up the death of these guys? And uh, if you know something about the physiology of crucifixion, you understand that, they, that they, die, they don't die from blood loss. There's not that much blood that's lost. They die from asphyxiation. Because, uh, because as you're up like this, uh, your hands, or actually more accurately, your wrists are nailed, and you've got your feet someplace, um, you sag quite a bit. And so the normal, the normal um, position is to have your, your um, lungs full of air but you have to be able to take in for it. So you have to actually push yourself up to exhale. And then inhale. And you could tell when someone died because they would do. And you couldn't push anymore. It was very obvious. So if you can break their legs, they can't inhale anymore. Actually, technically, you can't exhale anymore. It's just your last breath. So the, the authorities, being very religiously minded men who want to satisfy the law of Moses and to do the right thing according to the Passover, which is coming up because God will be, you know, he will be not happy with us if we violate his rules with the Passover coming down. Ask Pilate to break the legs of the king of the Jews. The irony's thick here. It's thick. So Pilate decides to go with it. So the soldiers came, broke the legs of the first man and the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they, they didn't break his legs. Have you heard the conspiracy theorists say, ah, you know, Jesus didn't really die. Ha, pretty smart, huh? He didn't really die. He just swooned. Well, when it, when it comes to history, I normally believe better the contemporaneous testimony of the people who were there. And this was so important to them. I mean, Pilate knew that these guys, these religious leaders had come to him because they're really ticked about the threat of who Jesus was. These guys aren't going to make any mistakes about the death of Jesus because this guy's just got to die. And the religious leader said, speed it up, speed it up, speed it up. We have to make God happy. You got to speed it up. Um, I'm surprised they didn't say, well, he looks pretty dead to me. Does he look dead to you? Yeah, he looks dead to me. Well, should we break his legs anyway? Well, that might be the safe thing to do. Let's just do that. What do you say? Well, okay, let's do that. And they'd break his leg. But they don't do that. They look, and very evidently he's dead. Because he did, <gasps> and probably hasn't done that for a long time. We know that four minutes without oxygen up here, and you're brain dead. They know it doesn't take long. Um, on a personal note, when we were with my mom, and she passed away several years ago in the hospital. We were there in her hospital bed, and uh, she's unconscious um, and breathing very labored. And as we, as we just waited for her to pass away, her breathing got shallower and less frequent. And then finally she took one last breath, and we all looked at each other and waited. And she never took another breath. There was no doubt in the room she'd gone. It's just, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see when death comes. And that's what they said about Jesus. He's gone already. We don't need to break his legs. Now this is important from the Old Testament. And John's the one who's going to remind us in just a second. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. It was another way to test. This is actually a flinch test. We were in junior high test. You know, where your friends would go, ha, ah, flinch, and they'd hit you. This is actually a big version of the flinch test because it wasn't so much to kill the person there so much as to say, listen, if he has even a slight amount of life left in him, we'll stick a blade in his side and he's going to flinch. Even when you're close to death, you're going to flinch. And they stuck the blade in and nothing happened. And then blood and water spilled out. We don't have time to talk about the significance of that. Uh, many... Christian physicians have looked at the composition of this blood and water and said, you know, it probably hit the pericardial sac. So this picture is kind of sticking the thing in from the wrong side. But that's not the significance here. The significance here is that without a question, he hasn't breathed for a long time. We all know he's dead. But let's just make sure if he flinches, there's a little bit left in him. This is the, this is the acid test. 
and he doesn't flinch. Again, very important from the Old Testament. Jesus could not orchestrate this moment. And John's not going to waste pointing this out. And he who has seen has testified. He's talking about himself again. I saw this, is what he's saying. And his testimony is true. My testimony is true, John's saying. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. John's just saying parenthetically, very strongly here, I saw all of this. I, this is not secondhand. I saw all of this. And my testimony is true. I'm telling you the truth. I'm saying this so that you'll believe. And in just a few chapters, John will say, I wrote all these things for the purpose that you might believe in who Jesus is and might be saved. And now he points it out. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. Psalm 34, 20. Can't orchestrate dying well enough so that someone doesn't break your legs. That's a hard one. But there's even more significance to this than just the fact that it's prophesied about the Messiah. Exodus 12, the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb to celebrate the leaving of Exodus, the Passover lamb is to be eaten in a single house. You're not to bring forth any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. Another place, Numbers 9, they shall leave none of it until morning. That's the, the lamb that they've roasted. Leave none of it till morning. You got to eat the whole thing, nor break a bone of it, nor break a bone of it. According to all the statute of the Passover, they shall observe it. And then when you run into the New Testament, you see John the Baptist in John 1.29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus come to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not an accident. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And when a Jew would think the Lamb of God, they would think the Lamb that sacrificed at Passover so that the angel of death would pass over them. And his bones not broken. That's just like a... I mean, if you walked up to a Jew and said, when you do sacrifices, what's the one animal you do that you do not break the bones? They'd say, Passover lamb. So this symbolism is not lost to most Jews. They get this. So, so in reality, the Passover lamb that day is Jesus. Interestingly enough, and some commentators debate about this, I happen to believe this, in the natural course of the Passover celebrations, you as a family had to sacrifice a lamb. And since you had to eat the entire lamb before morning, you usually did it with a couple of families. So you could either you go out and you sacrifice it at the temple. It would be ceremonially sacrificed by the priests. It would be roasted right there. You'd bring it back to the household. You and maybe a couple other families would be inside. And you wouldn't bring it outside the house until you'd eaten the entire thing. You didn't break a bone on it. It's very likely that at the very moment this is going on, those lambs are being sacrificed. Hundreds and thousands of lambs being sacrificed as the Lamb of God is on the cross. If it's not actually during this time, and that's the commentator's debates, it's within 24 hours of this. There is, there's no way, there's just no way that some of the people aren't catching this. At least after the fact, they'll catch this. I mean, they, they, you could go weeks later, maybe at Pentecost, seven weeks later, and say, Passover lamb? Jesus was sacrificed as the Passover lambs? John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His legs weren't broken. And you could say that and they go, oh, Passover lamb. I mean, God's being very direct with the nation of Israel right here. Very direct. It's lost on us a little bit because we don't know all the culture of it, but he's being very direct. Is he or is he not the King of kings and Lord of lords? Is he or is he not the suffering Messiah who would take away the sins of the world? Is he or is he not? And in the words of Jesus to his apostles, who do men say that I am? And again, John wants to make sure we don't miss it. They shall look on him whom they pierced. You can't orchestrate the fact that they tested for your death by sticking a blade in your side. The look on me whom they pierced. This whole passage right here I'm going to read to you because this is one of the most powerful passages in the Old Testament about the suffering Messiah. So look at this. I'll put this up on the left here. This is Zechariah 12.10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And what will happen after that? So that they'll look on me whom they've pierced. And they'll mourn for him. As one mourns for an only son, they'll weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This is what's going to happen in the nation of Israel. When the nation of Israel 
finally has the Spirit. And this, will, this is prophesied. When they, they'll finally look at Jesus, and in Jim's shorthand, they'll say, Oh man, what have we done? What have we done? They'll look upon me whom they have pierced. By the way, in that part of Zechariah, God is speaking first person right there. They'll look upon me whom they have pierced. This is the only Hebrew I know. There's a song that we uh, <laughs> have on an album from a group called Lamb. And, uh, and they sing this song. It's the only Hebrew I know, because I've sung it. Karen knows the song. <laughs> to look upon me whom they pierced. And their reaction, they'll mourn. They will mourn. At the time when Jesus is crucified here, the nation of Israel is largely clueless. Clueless. And to them, Jesus is just an irritant and a threat. But someday the Spirit will give them understanding and they'll realize, oh my gosh, we killed the Messiah. Now you know what? They'll hear those words in seven weeks at Pentecost. Seven weeks will elapse. Pentecost, another one of the feasts of the Jews will happen. And Peter, in the most remarkable turnabout in boldness, you know, the same guy who said, I don't know him, I, I don't know him, I don't know him, just this night, will stand up in front of thousands of people visiting Jerusalem and he'll say, this Jesus is the Messiah, and you killed him, quote unquote, and you killed him. And Peter isn't overrun by angry Jews. 3,000 of them follow Jesus. 3,000 of them realize a little bit of Zechariah 12, and they follow. Ah. Well, we need to wrap this up. After these things, verse 38, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. And so he came and he took away the body. Nicodemus, John reminds us, who had first come to him by night, remember him? John 3, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That, that Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. It was a lot of stuff. So they took the body of Jesus, they bound it in linen wrappings and spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So these are very, very close together, just like what you see in the, tomb of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. No one had been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they lead Jesus there. I mean, the word is that um, sunset was coming so fast, and sunset is the beginning of that next day. It was coming so fast, they didn't even have time to transport the body of Jesus across town to another grave. In fact, the, most of the graves were actually in the opposite side of town. They were east. This was slightly west. I mean, they said, you know, sun's going down. There's a grave. Let's put him there. Freshly hewn. Why, why do you think it is that no one had been put in there? Why was that important to God's plan that no one had been put in there? You ever thought about that? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I've got a theory. Well, that's right. You're not supposed to talk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have as hard a time breaking this as you. Well, here's the deal. After Jesus raises from the dead... The easiest way to prove that Jesus wasn't really dead would be to go into the tomb and say, body, right? Even if it was someone who'd recently died, they could say, body. And it would, it would be sort of unclear in terms of proving the reality of the resurrection. So clearly, this is the easier way to do it. This is a tomb that's been freshly cut. No one's been put in there. If anything is left inside there, it's either Jesus or nobody. I think that's part of the way that God said, let's just be very clear here. In all the secular accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, no one, Pilate, religious leaders, no one goes over the tomb, opens it up and says, <coughs> body, which is actually a testimony of the fact that the tomb is really empty. Now the question is, how did it get empty? And part of the unused tomb is a piece of that equation. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and he was put in there and it was sealed up. That's how they normally would seal up a tomb, by rolling the, the stone in front of it, um, which, by the way, looks easy to move, and it's not. It's quite hard to move. Um, it's actually on an uphill track, 
So moving something that heavy and rolling it on an uphill track is very hard. It takes, it takes many men to do it. So the question is, we finish the end of John 19, and Jesus is in the tomb. The question that's on everybody's mind at that moment is, is he or is he not the Messiah? I don't get how this works. How can the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one whom Gabriel came to Mary and said, your son will have a kingdom that will never end, dead in the grave? How does this work? I think every Jew in town, after seeing Jesus posted on the cross as they came in to celebrate Passover, as they celebrated the deliverance by God's hand for them, said, he's in the tomb. Could he be the Messiah? No. Maybe. Remember this passage? No. I mean, it was the debate of the day. And this is one of the passages they probably struggled with. And we bring this passage out at Christmas. For a child will be born to us, A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. The government will rest on his shoulders. The ultimate power for right and wrong will rest on his shoulders. How can he be in a tomb? How can he be in a tomb? And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Yeah. Mighty God. How can he be in a tomb? Eternal Father? Eternal? Dead? Eternal? Prince of peace who just suffered the most unjust violence? Prince of peace? And there it is. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. He's dead. And on the throne of David, and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. But he's in a tomb dead. See, and that's, that's the question. Not only for the people visiting Jerusalem during that day, but the apostles who all run away, who thought they knew Jesus was the Messiah, but he's dead. How can he be king? And so the hours between the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, which we'll look at next week, everyone was in a tizzy. The unbelievers, the believers, everyone's trying to figure out how it can be that the kingly Messiah and the suffering Messiah can be one and the same, maybe suffering Messiah and dead, but how is he ever going to rule if he's dead? I mean, even David, the throne of David. David's dead. David's not ruling anymore. But we do know in these passages that the Messiah, when he comes, will be like David, but so much more. Could he still be the one? So when Jesus is in the tomb, half of the emotion is losing a loved one because they love this man. But the biggest emotion is, is the plans for the kingdom off? Did we choose the wrong guy? Is who we thought he was wrong? Did he lie to me, Peter's thinking, when when I told him, Peter says, when I told him, you're the Christ. Did he lie when he says, yeah, you got it. Is the kingdom on or off? And that's the question as we come to Easter. Is there any hope? Is this one ever going to bring justice? Is there ever going to be a kingdom? And will I ever be included in that? Will I ever be reunited with the one I love? I mean, everything's up in the air. So, Everyone has Passover, and they wonder. Two guys who live in a small town nearby decide to just split and go home. They're so discouraged. Split and go home. Their home is Emmaus, by the way. And boy, do they get a surprise. (laughs) So we'll see that next week. But this is what I want to leave you with today. The issue at the crucifixion is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And in the entire message of the New Testament, the question is, who is Jesus? Can he be the Messiah? Can he be the King of kings and Lord of lords? And if he is the king, what's his kingdom like? And can I be part of that kingdom? Is he in power or is he weak? Who is this Jesus? And it's the issue of who Jesus is that separates all mankind. And it's the issue of Jesus that defines whether you'll be in his kingdom or not. So when we say you need to believe in Jesus, this is what you have to believe. Is he the king? Not just did he historically exist. And if he is the king, will you follow him?
Next week, we have good news. So let's pray. Father, this, this story never, uh, never stops moving me. I'm always convicted of the fact that, that Jesus did this because of what I did, because of what I did wrong, not, not because of what he did wrong. He did this voluntarily to save me from my own sins. And Lord, I pray, if there's anyone here that doesn't understand this, I pray that through your Spirit you'd give them an understanding that you came in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, to die on our behalf, to take the penalty for our sins, to pay the price for our sins and our own rebellion. And in one of the most, well, the most grand gesture of love that the whole universe will ever know, you died in our place. But we should have been on that cross. Lord, I pray you'd impress that thought and, and that you would allow them to come to you out of faith and say, I get it, I get it. Faith gives me the opportunity to, to lay hold of this incredible act of love on my behalf. And God, I'm yours. It's as simple as that. Lord, we thank you for drawing us to yourself. Thank you that it's because of your kindness and your kindness displayed on the cross that we've come to you. And we pray that you would continue through this Easter season to make known through our lives to those who don't understand this, who don't get it, that they might understand that this is the most grand sweeping gesture of love that you could ever place forth in front of mankind. And that it's all about just saying, yeah, yes, I'm yours. I'm purchased with the precious blood of Christ himself. Lord, encourage our hearts as we move to next week about the resurrection and the promise of new life out of old life. To be born again, like Jesus told that same Nicodemus three years before. You've got to be born again. <laughs> and then there's brand new life. So thank you for bringing us that brand new life in Jesus. We love you and continue to have our hearts overwhelmed by this loving action on your part for us. We love you and thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen.